My name is Janice Freeman Clark, and I am a professor of acting and voice, as well as the founding artistic director of Vanguard Theatre Company, whose mission is to change the narrative through theatre dedicated to dream. Diversity, reciprocity, education, activism, and mentorship. As a director and educator and mentor, I am always looking for ways to enlighten my student body and my actors as I feel that understanding the roots of your discipline is an important part of your process. That's why this is a passion project of sorts for me. Even though at times I have found it difficult to look back, I recognize that it's so important that we do so, so that we understand why we are where we are today and how we can collectively combat what's been systemically ingrained in all of us. Before I continue, I want to caution you that, that some of the images in this video might be triggering. In the 19th century, the most popular form of entertainment was the minstrel show. People would flock to the theater by the thousands to see a glimpse of real Negro experiences. You couldn't get a seat. Audiences would laugh hysterically and uncontrollably as they watched white blackface performers portray blacks as lazy, ignorant, sassy, criminal buffoons. Sadly, these stereotypes of an entire race of people still exist today, and they began in theater. I never quite understood when I was growing up why my father would get frustrated every time he heard me say the joke, why did the chicken cross the road? Years later, I would come to understand that that joke derived from the minstrel show. Why did the chicken cross the road? To get to the other side. My brother and I would giggle, not because the joke was funny, but because it was so dumb and unclever. What we didn't realize at the time was that that was the whole point. A punchline such as that would only come from an unclever, dim-witted person. Some of my favorite childhood songs, Camp Town Races, Swanee River, Way down upon a Swanee River, Oh Susanna. We all know these songs. We all loved these songs growing up. These songs are bred in American tradition. We learned them as early as preschool. But most of us don't know that their source is the minstrel show. Oh, Susanna's lyrics are about a black slave separated from his family in the slave market who is desperately trying to get back to them. Yet, we sing it with glee. Together through this piece, we will explore and unpack the gruesome facts about the origins of musical theater, the minstrel show, which majorly influenced and continues to influence the perception of black and brown people. But we'll also explore how some incredible black trailblazers attacked this art form head on and used it as a catalyst to change the narrative. Let's begin with a breakfast favorite, Aunt Jemima. Aunt Jemima. I wish I was on the Smiling, happy Aunt Jemima, famous for her secret recipe, pancakes, waffles, and buckwheat. What's your happy thought for today? Well, Mr. Lyon, folks says you can't buy happiness, but you can earn it. Yes, Aunt Jemima, and I guess we all want to be happy. Until just recently, Aunt Jemima was quite prevalent on our supermarket shelves. Nearby, Mrs. Butterworth and Mr. Frank L. White, also known as Mr. Cream of Wheat, hung out. And in a neighboring aisle, you would find Uncle Ben. Finally, due to public outrage, they've all been canceled. Took long enough. But the inexplicably grinning black face has been and continues to be a pervasive part of American culture. In advertising, in literature, in fashion, in politics, in pop culture, and most of all, in entertainment from whence it began. I'm a coming, I'm a coming, Master Elmer. Tote that bar, lift that bell, yes, yes. Only recently have black performers been able to break out of the roles that for so long have perpetuated the images of blacks as pickaninnies, zip coons, 
Mammies, Jezebels, and the image of happy musical people who would rather play than work, rather frolic than think. Such images have inevitably impacted the ways white America has viewed and treated black America. Their source, the minstrel show. Minstrel shows were one of the most popular forms of entertainment in the 19th century in America. Race lay at the center of minstrelsy. The shows were characterized primarily by the use of blackface performers who used makeup made of either burnt cork, grease paint, or shoe polish. The makeup was used to promote racist stereotypes, allowing performers to freely mock, degrade, and humiliate black people. Thomas Dartmouth Rice, an actor born in New York, is considered the father of minstrelsy. The story is told that Rice traveled to the South frequently to observe slaves. One stable hand in particular caught his attention, an older, supposedly crippled man on the property of a white man with the last name of Crow. He was singing a catchy song and doing a shuffling, hopping dance of sorts. Rice had the brilliant idea to turn the man's song and dance into a routine. He memorized the song, copied his hobbling dance, wrote some new verses, covered his face with a black concoction, and tried out the routine on stage. Wheel about and turn about and do just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. Wheel about and turn about and do just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. Jim Crow was an immediate hit. Reportedly, he won 20 encores, and soon Jumping Jim Crow was being performed to standing room only crowds of over 3,500 people in New York's Bowery Theater. With quick dance moves and exaggerated black vernacular and buffoonish behavior, Rice founded a new genre of racialized song and dance through Jim Crow, which became central to American entertainment in the North and eventually in the South. The widespread demeaning portrayals of Blacks paralleled a period when Southern state legislators were passing Black codes to restrict the behavior of former slaves and other Blacks. In fact, these codes would later be called Jim Crow Laws, named after the popular stage character. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. Like Rice, at the onset of minstrelsy, the majority of the composers, performers, and members of the audience were white. But the characters, and supposedly their exaggerated dialect, appearance, and behavior, was black. The perception was that the white performers portraying blacks were accurate, and that the songs were full of real Negro atmosphere. Minstrelsy centered on a romantic portrayal of Southern plantation life, demeaning caricatures that reduced African Americans to childish or inhuman figures, contented with slavery and an opportunity to, according to one song, sing for the white folks sing. Songs such as, Oh, happy are we darkies so gay. Come, let us sing and laugh while we play of course, were far from capturing the actual horrors of American slavery, as Blacks were being whipped and lynched by the thousands. The minstrel tradition not only demeaned Blacks, it helped define what was white and consequently human. The format of the minstrel show, usually in two parts, was established by a popular minstrel troupe known as the Christie Minstrels. The format changed little thereafter. The curtain would open to reveal black face performers arranged in a semicircle, with Mr. Tambo, tambourine, and Mr. Bones, who rattled the bones, at the ends. The actors would happily strut, sing, and bang on their tambourines. At the conclusion of the opening number, the interlocutor would appear in the center. He'd give the command. Gentlemen, be seated. Next, 
followed a series of demeaning jokes and skits. <laughs> Enjoying myself. I sure is. <laughs> you know, I got the best joke in the world, Mr. Bissett. Do you mind telling it? You know, our cat has chicken. Wait a minute now, wait a minute. Whoa, how on earth could a cat have chicken? You remember when you were down to my house and you left a big basket of chickens on the kitchen table? I remember that distinctly. Yes. Uh, our cat has them. <laughs> In minstrel shows, blacks were often portrayed as living on southern plantations with their loving master and mistress, who were characterized as their parents. And all the darkies, regardless of age, were considered their children, because of course the black people couldn't take care of themselves. The most popular black members of this family were the mammy and the old uncle. Maybe that's why it was so hard to let them go. The darkies on the southern plantations were jolly and secure with their families, but the blacks living in the northern towns were perplexed and insecure. They were depicted as ignorant, bumbling buffoons who were totally out of place outside the South. A zip coon was one of these major stereotypes, someone who aspires to great dignity, wisdom, and intelligence, but his mangling of language always makes him appear foolish and ignorant. His costume shows how absurd blacks could be when they tried living like white gentlemen. We will now have the financial report from the mayor himself, Slim Williams. My friends, it is indeed a financial pleasure to have so many of you resemble here today on this suspicious occasion. Now, we have resembled here to elect a new mayor. But before I proceed any further, I must tell you that the treasurer of our club is missing. Yes, he's gone. He is five feet, 11 and a half inches tall, and he is $69.80 short. Right around the time that film began to take off, it's important to note that some of the biggest celebrities of the time performed in blackface, including Bing Crosby, Shirley Temple, Fred Astaire, and Judy Garland. Initially, it was unacceptable for black performers to participate in minstrel shows, but eventually talented black individuals began making their way into minstrel troops. As odd as it may seem, the content itself did not change and continued to perpetuate the same negative stereotypes. It may seem curious that Blacks would be willing to participate in such horrendous and self-deprecating humor, but this was the only way that Whites would accept Blacks on stage as performers at the time. The huge downside to this was of course, the willingness of black performers to participate in, min in minstrel shows was interpreted by the audience as an undeniable confirmation of the stereotypes perpetuated by the performances. To gain audiences, black minstrels stress their authentic race, claiming to be ordinary ex-slaves doing what came naturally, rather than white entertainers acting out white created stereotypes of blacks. By the 1870s, black minstrels had become the acknowledged experts in plantation material. One white critic even attacked the white minstrel as, at best, a base imitator. A lot of the best black talent of that generation came down the same minstrel pipe, including artists such as Burt Williams. Bert Williams then found a performance partner in a man by the name of George Walker. And together, they had a very successful duo act that landed them a spot in Coster and Biles' vaudeville show in New York City, one of the biggest names in show business. But in a very short time, they began to work for themselves. They created an act they called Two Real Coons, which launched their careers in earnest. Once established, 
they began to morph and use commercial popular entertainment and their newfound fame as a means to improve conditions for Black people. They began to infuse political commentary with their comedic menstrual routines, offering a more intelligent and sophisticated representation of Black people. On another level, they aimed to tweak the popular music idiom of the day, which was dominated by coon songs. They wanted to show it was possible to sing songs about Black characters without resorting to the most horrendous and demeaning stereotypes. Williams and Walker prided themselves on hiring as many Black performers and songwriters as possible. Some of their hires included writers Ernest Hogan, Will Aku, James Weldon Johnson, Rosamond Johnson, R.C. McPherson, James T. Brin, and Bob Cole, just to name a few. Burt Williams and George Walker saw themselves not just as entertainers, but also as part of a vanguard, fighting to bring about positive social change. They were also integral in the first tellings of fully developed stories, incorporating song, acting, and dance, a la the origins of the book musical. In Dahomey, which starred Williams and Walker, is considered a landmark in American musical comedy. It was one of the first full-length musicals written and played by Blacks to be performed at a major Broadway house. Only the 1898 production of A Trip to Coontown by Bob Cole and Billy Johnson and Clorindy by William Cook and Paul Lawrence Dunbar came prior. In Dahomey also featured the writings of Cook and Dunbar. It was written by Jesse A. Shipp as well as a satire on the American Colonization Society's Back to Africa movement of the earlier 19th century. Fun side effect, my late voice teacher, the legendary Shirley Verrett, starred in the 1999 revival adaptation of In Dahomey at the Henry Street Settlement Theater in New York City. She was an extraordinary performer and teacher. After the 1903 production of In Dahomey, Williams and Walker continued to take the newly established book musical to new heights on Broadway. Alongside the Black writing team, Jesse A. Shipp and Alex Rogers, their next production was the 1906 production of Abyssinia, which told the story of Rastus Johnson winning a lottery and taking his pal to the African country of their ancestors. Oh, never done nothing. To know about it. Oh, I never got nothing from As a black female founding artistic director of a theater company who also happened to study both theater and classical voice, I'm admittedly obsessed with the next pair of artists that we'll be exploring. The nearly forgotten. Hires sisters. Anna and Emma Hires were civil rights artists activists who found a way to use their talents to fight against the stereotypes displayed in minstrelsy. Their parents, Samuel B. and Annie E. Hires, came west to Sacramento after the gold rush. Samuel made sure his daughters received both piano lessons and vocal training with German professor Hugo Sank and later opera singer Josephine Dormy. They performed for many private parties before making their professional stage debut on April 22, 1867 at Sacramento's Metropolitan Theater at the mere ages of nine and 11. By the time they were 14 and 16, a Boston critic wrote, they are destined to occupy a high position in the musical world. Soon after, Anna, a soprano, and Emma, a contralto, became the first African-American women to succeed nationwide as mainstream touring concert artists, with rave reviews everywhere they went. And the reviewers concentrated on the stellar qualities of their voices and seldom focused on their race. 
1872, the Higher Sisters performed at the World Peace Jubilee, a festival held in Boston. It was the first major musical production in the country to feature artists of many colors together on the same stage. They were headed for greatness in the world of opera. But prior to heading overseas to continue building promising opera careers, they felt the call and pull to remain in the States and use their mainstream popularity to confront the ridicule of African Americans by touring blackface minstrels. In so doing, they started a theater company and they created the first civil rights musicals. Written by Joseph Bradford and Pauline Hopkins, the Higher Sisters produced Out of Bondage, the first full-fledged musical play in which African Americans themselves comment on the plight of the slaves and the relief of emancipation without the disguises of minstrel comedy. Out of Bondage depicts the story of one slave family's experiences in the antebellum South and their struggles to enter free society at the conclusion of the Civil War. After liberation by Union troops, the family separates when four younger family members decide to travel north from Georgia with hopes of making a living as musicians. And older family members stay behind, feeling too old to begin a new life in the foreign cultural environment of the north. Their theater company's 1890 production of Out of Bondage was one of the first musicals to be produced by a black organization, thus signaling the transition from the minstrel show to black musical theater. The manuscript written in ink on lined paper can still be found today in the Library of Congress. The sisters would go on to produce several other musicals, including the Underground Railroad. This piece was about an African-American slave family from the bonds of slavery on a plantation in Mississippi to freedom in the North. They also produced a musical by the name of Yurlina, the African Princess, where black love and romance was explored. Their stage version of Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1880 showcased theater's very first integrated cast 30 years before Burt Williams would integrate the 1910 Ziegfeld Follies. From slavery to freedom, their musicals extolled the dignity and honest stories of their people. Thanks to the Higher Sisters, Out of Bondage and their subsequent musicals began to remove the chains of minstrelsy, giving courage to Black artists to tell their stories and use their authentic voices. We are forever grateful for theater makers, producers, and artistic directors, and change makers like the Higher Sisters, Burt Williams, George Walker, and a myriad of other incredible Black writers, composers, producers, who were integral in setting the stage for the American musical. Thank you. We stand on the shoulders of these giants as we continue to do the work to change the narrative.